Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Emily Carr, University of Art and Design. I first would like to welcome uh, the Consul General of Switzerland, Andreas Rufer, the Senior Science Counselor of the Swiss Embassy in Ottawa, over there. <laughs> then all the faculty members and students from Emily Carr University, and our panelist and moderator for the event today. So distinguished guests, um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Swiss Consulate to the second event of the Innovation Fest. We uh, launched the Innovation Fest on Wednesday in Science World. We opened the exhibition Inside CERN by Swiss photographer Andre Paul. And um, his exhibition will be on display for three months at Science World. So I would like to encourage you all to go see this exhibition. It's really fantastic and, and worth the visit. And then a few words on, on how this Innovation Fest came about. And the Consul General, Andreas Rufer, and I have talked time and time again on how we would like to organize an event um, around arts and science. And then in early 2020, I met Scott Mallory. He's also a faculty member here at Emily Carr University. He's the arts and culture curator at Triumph and the founder of ISM Arts and Culture. And together, we started to develop the idea of uh, a series of events around arts and science. And then last year we start reaching out to local partners and we started to develop the project that we now call the Swiss Innovation Fest. So I would like to thank Scott and his team, Nidi, um, especially also for today and for the organization of this um, festival. And then I would also like to uh, introduce our partner institutions which make this whole festival possible. So we have today's host, uh, Emily Carr University. They are hosting today's event and they also uh, are part of the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Then we have, as I mentioned before, Science World who um, hosted the opening event and the exhibition. Then we have Triumph, Canada's National Particle Accelerator. They are based on the campus of the University of British Columbia. They are also included in today's panel and they're also included in an event that we're organizing tomorrow. And then we'll also have um, New Media Gallery and they are hosting an exhibition which will start on June 1st, Indivisible, featuring uh, two artists from uh, former artists in residence at Arts at CERN, that's the cultural department at CERN. Yes. And with that, I would like to pass on the word to our moderator today, Sanem Güvec. She's a sociologist based here in Vancouver. She teaches crit critical studies at Emily Carr University, where she focuses on post-humanism, the anthropoxene, and philosophy of science and medicine. So Sanem, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Nina, and welcome, everyone. Um, it is great to see all of you here, uh, and it is such a pleasure uh, to have you here at Emily Carr University, uh, which is situated on the unceded territorial and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And even though I'm welcoming you today as the host, uh, I'm actually a guest on these lands where I have been working walking, running, playing um, as a settler uh, since 2016, and I'm grateful for the hospitality that I receive. As Nina said, I am the moderator for today's event, and uh, I'm currently a visiting scholar at Emily Carr, and I teach critical studies. Um, and, but my background is in science studies, um, and so for more than two decades, actually, uh, since I finished my PhD, uh, I am very much interested in the practice of science and the world of scientists. Um, and since 2017, I'm also in the world of artists in Emily Carr, so I am um, partially like in between uh, both worlds, I feel, as a, as a scholar, and I have been a, uh, involved in the Leaning Out of Windows project as a scholar uh, since 2018. So today, um, we will have um, presentations and we will have a panel. 
uh, and we are in the company of such distinguished artists and scientists, um, and it is my honor and privilege to be welcoming them to Emily Carr, to the Reliance Theater. Uh, for years, they have been working in collaboration with other artists and scientists, um, and today we will hear from them about their experiences of collaboration, uh, but first, we will listen to uh, presentations by um, Michael Doser, uh, Nirmal Raj, uh, Ingrid Koenig, Mimi Gelman, and Randy Lee Cutler, and they will set the context for us. Um, and then we will have like a two-minute breather. Uh, I'm going to ask you to kindly stay. Uh, maybe you can chat among yourselves while we set up the stage for the panel, and we will have about like 45 minutes uh, of discussion about um, collaboration, um, uh, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And on the panel, we will have uh, two distinguished scientists, uh, Clara Nellis and Beatrice Franke with us. Um, and um, that will be the end, and then we will have cocktails um, in the atrium. So, without further ado, um, I would like to invite to the stage Michael Dozer, um, senior research physicist at CERN, uh, and he's going to set the context about CERN innovation, science and technology, arts and culture. Uh, Michael has been a member of CERN's cultural advisory board, uh, of TED at CERN, uh, and of SPARKS uh, advisory board. He works on AGIS collaboration to measure the gravitational interaction between matter and antimatter. Uh, and from what I have gathered by peeking into his TED talk at Geneva, uh, he's also an admirer of horror films. <laughs> Welcome, Michael. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this works wonderfully. Um, I have the impossible task of talking about CERN, physics program at CERN, my own experiment, uh, collaboration, diversity, and uh, the arts program in 20 minutes. So I'm going to zip through this, and I hope I'll give you an approximate idea of what this is all about at CERN. Uh, for those who have never seen CERN, uh, this is an aerial picture of the Geneva area with the Lake of Geneva, the airport here, and right next to it, the very large, large Hadron Collider which is actually fed by the CERN site down here, and on which you can see the position of these accelerators, the different accelerators that produce the particles that are used to try to understand the building blocks of the universe and try to understand how these building blocks interact with each other, and more importantly, try to understand whether we can see flaws in this uh, description that we have of the universe. The, Four experiments on this Large Hadron Collider are the CMS experiment, the LHCB experiment, the ALICE experiment, and the ATLAS experiment. And here we're talking about experiments that are huge by any normal scale. This is the compact one, the CMS experiment. So here you see the scale uh, by the size of these uh, three researchers in the center, and this is not the biggest experiment at CERN. In fact, uh, these experiments consist of some 4,000 physicists coming from 250 institutes, collaborations that are formed across the world. The CMS Institute, the ATLAS Institu uh, experiment are the largest of these. ALICE and LHCB experiments are slightly smaller, but even there, you have a collaboration of uh, hundreds of institutes across the world. And the way these uh, collaborations work is that they have a geographical and cultural diversity of coming from about 110 different countries, and about a quarter of the involved physicists are women. Uh, 6,600 participants from the member states of CERN, uh, but also very large contributions from uh, Japan, Russia, the United States, and non-member states and territories. So it's a very, very diverse environment and uh, one that has a very unique uh, age profile where most of the participants at CERN are under the age of 35 or so, but where the age profile extends well beyond retirement up to about 95 years old. The outcome of the work there, these young um, beginning researchers end up to about 50% in industry, to about 30% in academia, and to about 20% in other areas. 
And uh, in addition to this program at the LHC, CERN also has a diverse physics program in nuclear physics at a uh, research center called Isolde, uh, antimatter research at the antiproton decelerator, but also experiments relevant for uh, climate, um, as well as uh, searches for rare phenomena, different approaches to the same kind of physics. And I'll be talking a little bit about this low energy particle physics domain, in particular with a focus on antimatter, which is here at this small accelerator, where a range of experiments take place with antiprotons that are produced by protons that would normally be fed into the Large Hadron Collider, but are used to produce antiprotons. And these antiprotons are used to study a very fundamental question, namely the imbalance that we see in the universe between matter and antimatter. If I had a telescope that could look out into the universe and could differentiate between matter and antimatter, that telescope would see this if it looks for matter and this if it sees antimatter. The problem that we're trying to look into is that there is no evidence of antimatter in the universe, although we expect that the antimatter and matter components should be equal since the Big Bang. And so what we're trying to figure out with the study of antimatter is what this difference between matter and antimatter might be. Or rather, in other words, why we don't have a symmetric universe, which is what we expect, but rather an anti-symmetric, an asymmetric universe with only matter being left over since the Big Bang. And in order to explain this, we believe that there must be a difference between matter and antimatter, a symmetry breaking between the two. And looking for the symmetry breaking means either studying the intrinsic properties of particles, so their charge, for example, or their mass or their lifetime. And this means looking for these symmetries, charge invariance, mirror symmetry, time invariance, or looking for a asymmetry in the coupling to forces, in the four forces that we know of, the strong interaction, the weak interaction, the gravitational interaction, and the electromagnetic interaction. And for this, in the world's only antimatter facility, six experiments, the alpha and alpha G experiments, where there's a strong contribution here at Triumph, the Asaksa experiment, the Puma experiment, the G-Bar experiment, the BASE and the Aegis experiments, are looking in different directions, trying to find a difference between matter and antimatter. Uh, my experiment is looking at gravity, trying to see whether matter and antimatter behave differently. And to do that, you basically have two approaches. One consists of using very cold trapped antihydrogen and dropping it and seeing how it falls. The other one is to try to use a pulsed cold beam of antihydrogen, a little bit like this image where you launch antihydrogen atoms or hydrogen atoms and then watch them fly on a parabolic trajectory. And so this is the Aegis experiment which focuses on antihydrogen gravity and a bunch of other um, areas of physics that are equally interesting. It's a very small experiment on the scale of the LHC experiment, but even here, this is a group of about 40 physicists from about 15 different institutions from across the world, in our case, where, again, collaboration issues are a, a large question. The canon I was talking about before is here at the heart of the experiment, where we shoot out antihydrogen atoms, and if they fly horizontally, they would end up on a detector. On this detector, we produce regular patterns, which allow us to have a reference system. And then by launching antihydrogen atom by antihydrogen atom, one can measure how far gravity has pulled them down by reconstructing the point where they hit these detectors. So you do this for a number of atoms. You throw atom after atom after atom. And over time, you develop these clusters that you can compare with your reference scale and measure how far they've dropped. Now, the best detectors we've had up to now are photographic plates. They have a very, very high resolution, and when you develop a photographic plate that has been hit by an antiproton, this is the kind of image you get as you scan through the plate in very small steps, and you can see in each one of these steps as the microscope focuses, the exact point where charged particles from the annihilation of the antiparticle with a silver nucleus then end up with. This image can be completely reconstructed and then turned into a 3D image, which you can then look at 
from all sides. So you get this, this ghostly image of the disappearance act of an antiproton or an antihydrogen atom here, and you can reconstruct this point with an extraordinary precision of about a thousandth of a millimeter. For us, this is where the, the voyage ends. For the artists, this is where it begins. This is a composition that was made by the semiconductor group that worked at CERN, these are artists in residence, that took all our images that we've made over time and conflated them into a huge panel, a three by four meter sized picture, with many, many antimatter interactions. Each one of these scratches is one antiproton annihilating, producing secondaries. And from this kind of image, we want to extract gravity, but they are interested by the pure beauty of this object. And so this brings me to the arts program at CERN. Uh, it's something that was established about 10 years ago by Ariane Cook and uh, that has now been taken over and is being expanded by Monica Bello for the last five years with three different strands. The first one is the Collide strand. These are artist residencies which last three months, one artist at a time. This is an international competition and there's one or two per year. The second strand is the Accelerate strand. These are very short visits of about one month. These are national programs funded by the countries that send the artists. Uh, and these are consistent with research visits. And then, of course, there are curated artist visits. Artists who come to visit CERN uh, for one or two days. And there we have um, about a visit a month. And all of these are selected by a mixed jury of experts in art and in science. Uh, so that all communities have a voice in uh, the matter. Uh, the first artist in residence was Julius von Bismarck. Uh, he was the first one in a combined prize between Ars Electronica from Austria and uh, Collide at CERN. And then uh, two years later, Ryoji Ikeda came to CERN. Then in the accelerated uh, groups, we've had architects, a group of architects here, uh, and a group of uh, digital performance artists who came in 2015. And among the visitor, visiting artists, we've had um, jewelers, uh, fashion designers, photographers, um, sculptors, Arnsem Kiefer, I don't even need to say who, what, what his medium is, and uh, the composer Esa Pekka Salonen. And in fact, uh, what one then gets is, uh, for example, here, a fashion photography event where the dresses that were made by Iris van Herpen were photographed by Nick Knight in the antimatter factory. So we're back to antimatter again. And uh, this is an example of the kinds of interactions that you can then have between the artists and the scientists, where uh, you learn from the artists to meander and to focus on the fundamental questions and in the best of all cases, uh, ends up inspiring and triggering curiosity. So with that, I'd like to finish here. Um, thank you, Michael, very much. Um, and now I would like to invite Nirmal Raj. Uh, he is a theoretical physicist at Triumph. Um, and also, he was part of uh, the low, the phase four, uh, the one that just ended now, um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Nirmal uh, addresses puzzles and holes in the current best microscopic theory we have for explaining observations in nature. Uh, he tries to unmask the identity of dark matter, the ubiquitous substance making up most of the matter in the universe. Welcome, Nirmal. So thanks, thanks for having me, um, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, so ah, there it is. Okay. Um, so I was asked to talk about um, collaboration, and um, it will be my pleasure to do so. Um, so I want to make a point right off the bat, and that is that the act of doing science. <clears throat> is more an art and less a science. And I'm gonna prove it to you uh, in the next two minutes. Um, so, and I'm gonna do that by invoking the um, Aegis experiment uh, that Michael, Doss Michael Dossel was talking about. Um, so here's the Aegis experiment. Uh, but Aegis in Greek mythology 
um, was the shield of Athena, uh, who was the Olympian goddess of um, wisdom and uh, warfare. That's why she has a shield. Um, probably known better to us as Minerva, which is her Roman name. Um, now, Athena is the daughter of Zeus and uh, his tutor Metis, and Zeus being Zeus, this is the result of an extramarital affair because Zeus is married to Hera, um, ironically the goddess of marriage. And um, embossed in the shield of Athena um, is the head of Medusa, who's a monster with uh, snakes for a haircut. Um, and uh, the Medusa's head is cut off by Perseus, um, and when he does that, she's pregnant um, with the children of Poseidon, um, and from her severe neck emerges uh, one of her children, which is Pegasus, the winged horse that we see everywhere. Um, and Pegasus is famous for um, slaying, uh, helping to slay uh, the Chimera, uh, which is a fire-breathing monstrosity. The reason I'm telling you this story um, is that all the characters that I mentioned have an experiment uh, named after them in fundamental physics. If not an experiment, uh, a code or some phenomenon. Um, but that's not all. Um, Greek mythology is a very vast subject with an epic timeline, and almost everybody and everything in it gets a place in fundamental physics in some form or the other, and that includes the Atlas experiment uh, of that, that, that Clara works in. Um, so I want to use this fact um, to clarify something about scientists, um, something that I'm sure you already know, um, which is that um, as part of our, the daily grind of scientists, we strive to be rigorous and technical and precise uh, and skeptical. Um, but what the, the instincts that actually drive us, um, which are always in the background uh, as a bigger picture and that inform our decisions, uh, these instincts are aesthetics and narrative and awe and curiosity. Right? And although I'm showing you this cartoon uh, with uh, different functionalities of the left brain versus the right brain, um, I actually want to use that uh, to make a broader point, which is that this is actually an exaggerated picture, um, because neuroscientists tell us that uh, brain functionalities are much more evenly spread out across the hemispheres, the brain hemispheres, than this. Um, and the corollary to this is that we all have all these instincts, whether we choose to practice them or not. Okay, so let me uh, move on to um, what I work on. I spend a large fraction of my time attacking the problem of uh, what is known as dark matter. This is a substance um, that um, doesn't uh, reflect or emit or absorb light. It's unfriendly to light, and that's why it's called dark. Um, and we, we've observed uh, the substance all over the universe uh, because it pulls on everything else that's visible we are the force of gravity. And more compellingly, um, this dark matter makes up five-sixths of all the matter in the universe. And that means um, the world of atoms, everything that we could see in our telescopes and with our eyes, um, is, but a con is but a small contamination uh, as far as creation is concerned. Right? Um, and the real crisis is that we have no idea uh, what dark matter is made of. We have a very good idea of the world of uh, atoms. Uh, we, we know a lot about its microscopics, uh, but we are not even close to unmasking the microscopic identity of this dark matter that makes up most of the matter in the universe. Now, where do I come into this? So the smallest um, sizes that we know, uh, that we have observed, astronomers have observed uh, dark matter uh, to, to, to get collected in, are uh, structures known as dwarf galaxies that are around 10 power 20 meters across, okay? But at the same time, um, physicists are looking for this dark matter uh, in, in underground detectors all over the world um, in detectors as small as a meter, which you could see here with physicists for scale, right? Um, so these, are, these, are, these go by the name of direct detection because it attempts to catch the dark matter in the flesh underground. Now, if, you, if we have the, the smallest sizes that we measure dark matter in, in meters, is uh, one followed by 20 zeros, and you're measuring it all the way down here with just one meter, how do you take this leap of faith across these 20 orders of magnitude, right? 
Um, well, uh, the bridge between these scales is theory, basically mathematical guesses for what the dark matter could be. So when you make a search, um, you do it under the assumption of a well-motivated theory, and you attack that particular guess for what dark matter is. Okay? Um, let me show you uh, how this works out in practice, uh, while also illustrating how all this is enmeshed uh, with the process of collaboration between humans. So a few years ago, I was having dinner with some of my friends at a workshop uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, and one thing led to another, and we suddenly realized that the experiments that I was just talking about are actually capable of discovering dark matter, or at least looking for dark matter, all the way uh, at the Planck mass, which is the heaviest mass that an elementary particle can have. That's about 10 micrograms. Um, so um, we went home and um, wrote a paper about it. Um, and notice that we used words like discovering in the title to be optimistic. Um, and also notice that because we are from different affiliations, um, other than uh, the first dinner meeting, everything else was virtual, which is pretty common in STEAM, 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 STEAM fields. Um, and then in the year that followed, there were two more papers. Uh, notice that we are still using words like foraging for dark matter because we are still optimistic. And then two names got added to the second paper. Three names got removed to th from the third paper uh, because this is also typical of science, uh, this kind of fluid uh, co combinations and separations in collaborations. And then um, I got on board an experiment. Uh, although I'm a theorist, uh, I, I really wanted to see this through, so I, I convinced some experimentalists to look for it. Um, and um, so I got started on uh, the search uh, at the DEEP 3600 experiment, which is the largest dark matter experiment uh, to be built so far. Um, and this, the actual search uh, took more than two years to complete. Um, and we didn't find dark matter, uh, but at least we, we were now able to make an actual statement about a phenomenon in nature. This, that's the difference between the previous papers and this paper. This is an actual statement about nature that there are some certain constraints on dark, on dark matter at the Planck scale. Um, now, speaking of collaboration, so here uh, is the working group um, with whom I was meeting uh, for more than two years every week. Um, this is the team that did all the hard work and the innovation, uh, in, at least in the beginning stages, uh, sitting in all these various uh, countries. Um, but when the paper came out, this was the author list. That's 97 co-authors. Um, experimentalists are used to this, but I, I was not. Um, and this is partly because uh, everybody on board, almost everybody on board the experiment, uh, had a stab uh, at the draft. Um, um, but mainly because it was the policy of uh, the deep collaboration to list everyone on the experiment. And for good reasons, um, because everyone was involved at some point in the designing of the experiment, constructing it, improving it, and so on. Now, one cool perk of this policy uh, is that uh, I got to be co-author uh, with the Nobel laureate. Um, and that's because among Deep's ranks um, is uh, Art McDonald, uh, the, the 2015 uh, co-winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics. So speaking of collaboration with Art, um, that is the finished product um, of uh, the Art and Science um, collaborative project. Uh, or co called uh, Leaning Out of Windows, organized by Ingrid and Randy. Um, and this year's theme was Invisible Forces. And these are the fantastic artists uh, with whom I worked for this project. Um, now, Rana Mukherjee, in her own words, um, does hybrid forms of painting, film, and installation. And here's an example of her work that she uh, has titled Shadow Time. Haley Bassett specializes in sculpture, installation, and social practice. Uh, and she often uses uh, floral motifs, and here's one of her uh, amazing installations. And Kyla Gilbert specializes um, in multimedia shows and sculptural work, and here's an example of that um, with concrete and steel. Um, now, we had an incredible and exciting collaboration um, over eight months, I believe. Um, and we are all very proud of the final uh, product uh, that we created. Um, and here's the reason, uh, here are some reasons why I, I think why we clicked. Um, I think um, that um, one key to a successful collaboration um, is rapport. 
and Isaac Asimov, to me, said it best. Um, for best purposes, there should be a feeling of informality. Joviality encourages a willingness to be involved in the folly of creativeness. It's, that's actually, I think I lost the, the words there, in, in the folly of creativeness. Um, so one amazing thing that happened was that very early on in the project, uh, we were very comfortable about um, uh, not knowing much about each other's worlds. So there was a lot of questions being asked around. Um, and then another amazing thing that happened uh, was that um, we were using language uh, to bridge across our worlds, because that's the function of language. Um, but we were also actually modifying the specialized language that we were used to in order to reach out. And more importantly, we were actually unconsciously using language itself as an engine for ideas. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. This is uh, one of uh, this is a whiteboard from one of our very early meetings. Um, we are basically jotting down um, phrases uh, that were spontaneously uttered by by us that someone or the other resonated with. Um, so at this point, our thoughts are formless, and there's no direction to it. Um, we were just spitballing. Um, and one of the things that I unconsciously said was the phrase "past presence" in some in some context. Uh, and the artists liked that, so they, they were like, let's, let's use this to interpret invisible forces. And then that became our central theme. We were going to do something that depicted the invisibility through time. Um, okay, so um, here's another reason uh, I think uh, that we clicked. Um, we came from very different, I mean, we, we came in uh, with very different talents. Uh, we came from different ethnic backgrounds and gender. So intrinsically, we were, uh, we were able to bring in uh, something unique and essential uh, to the project, making for a super fun and eclectic collaboration. Right? Um, and then somewhere down the line uh, came my placemat. Uh, my placemat looks like this. This is uh, a cartoon of the timeline of the universe, where time goes from left to right. Um, and the various layers uh, depict uh, different cosmological epochs that shape the universe as we see it today. Now, um, sorry, I, I, I brought this in uh, to, to, to basically, um, to, I, I just brought this in very spontaneously, very casually, to, to show the artists um, uh, how the universe evolves and how past events can actually shape the present universe. Um, and then that also became one of our central themes. Um, but the interesting thing is, today I genuinely do not remember which came first, whether it was the idea of using layers of fabrics in the sculpture or the placemat with the cosmological epochs. I, I'm really not sure which one came first. There, there, we do have Zoom recordings. We could go back and check out what exactly happened there. Um, but that is exactly the nature of deep collaboration. Right? It's messy and confused and entangled. Uh, you don't really know what comes first and who, who, who comes up with ideas. It, it, these things just snowball. Um, and uh, what I do know for sure is that um, these ideas, from this point on, informed each other constantly uh, in making our decisions uh, for both the sculpture and the pamphlet that accompanied it. And speaking of that, um, here's me uh, with the exhibit. Um, and here are some extracts uh, from a handout uh, that I wrote, kind of sort of explaining what's going on in the sculpture. Um, and uh, the, the, so, so the, 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 um, the, the extracts were basically stenciled in painstakingly by Ranu Mukherjee in some of her prized fabrics. Um, and I have to say that the handout happened at all entirely because of, the, because of encouragement from the artists. Uh, because they wanted me to contribute not just as a physicist, but also as a poet slash writer. And I would like to think uh, that that is because they wanted to bring out the artist in me in, returning for, in return for awakening the scientist in them. Um, so how am I doing on time? OK, good. Um, so uh, I just, I'm just three slides out. So, um, and all that reminded me um, of um, Renaissance men like um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and it made me think that not only were people like da Vinci and artists and scientists rolled into one mind, but that um, his uh, artistic endeavors must have informed his scientific ac accomplishments and vice versa. 
to draw the same lesson from a different Renaissance artist. Here's Johannes Vermeer, uh, and here's one of his uh, famous paintings uh, that capture light uh, as though it's a photograph. Well, there is a leading theory that um, uh, he, he did use something uh, like a camera, a device called a camera obscura, uh, to, to get his uh, lighting realistically. Um, so, um, so, so, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here um, is that, um, well, let me just go to my summary, um, which is, um, I, I would urge everyone here to embrace your in, inner Renaissance person and, and not be defined by simple labels. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Now um, I would like to invite uh, Randy, Ingrid, and Mimi to stage. Um, they're going to talk about the low process uh, collaboration, uh, and Mimi will going to is going to talk about her experience uh, within low uh, by bringing in indigenous knowledges. Um, and um, let me introduce each one of the speakers. Uh, Randy Cutler is an artist uh, and writer and part of the Emily Carr faculty. Uh, she investigates the emergence of new cultural forms through an exploration of the intersections of gender, art, science and technology, and is a co-investigator of the Leaning Out of Windows collaboration between art and science. Her work has shown nationally and internationally, including the Biennale of Sydney, Niren, in 2020. Uh, Vancouver Art Gallery, Balkan Art Gallery, and uh, Ahva Gallery, both at uh, the University of British Columbia, Access Gallery, Art Speak, uh, Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver, uh, Western Front, Tate Modern, and Seoul uh, International uh, New Media Festival. Ingrid Koenig is an artist uh, and part of Emily Carr faculty. Um, she is uh, her studio-based practice is in Vancouver, uh, and it traverses the fields of theoretical physics, social history, and narratives of science through visual arts and relational projects. Uh, Ingrid was an artist in residence at Triumph, uh, Canada's Particle Accelerator Center, and co-organizes processes of collaboration between artists and physicists as a co-investigator of leaning out of windows. Uh, Ingrid is inspired by the possibilities of co-thought uh, as a way to navigate complex phenomena and to hold different ways of knowing in relationship to each other. And uh, Mimi Gelman, uh, she is Ashkenazi, Ashinabe, Metis, a visual artist, designer and educator and also part of Emily Carr faculty. Uh, Mimi's interdisciplinary work explores phenomenology and technologies of intuition through an embodied practice of walking and mapping and through works and installations that point to the animacy and agency of objects. The cross-cultural dialogue exemplified in her work brings forward the colonial, the colonial aesthetic perspectives and suggests a pre-existing connection to the other than human worlds. Welcome, all of you. Famous comedian line. Is this on? Yes. Is this on? Is this, <laughs> is this on? Is this working? Yes. Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be here and to follow um, the speakers thus far. Um, I kind of super giddy and excited to be here and to be hearing all of these um, thoughts. And so we are going to begin with our presentation. There you go. Great. So, um, Leaning Out of Windows, Art and Physics Collaboration Through Aesthetics Transformation is a research creation project that explores how knowledge might be translated across the disciplinary communities of art and physics in order to develop a shared and emergent understanding of scientific phenomena. The project assesses methodologies of collaboration to develop ways to engage with the diverse languages employed by artists and physicists, namely between Emily Carr University and Triumph, Canada's Particle Accelerator Centre. Working with the metaphor leaning out of windows, the project investigates how a participant resides within their field of expertise while simultaneously inhabiting an expanded space of experimentation, risk, and not knowing. 
Through interdisciplinary collaboration, scientists and artists were asked to engage in a collective process by responding to topics. Our first one was antimatter, the second one was emergence, and the third was invisible forces. But rather than getting the science topic right, the project focuses on an exchange of ideas from various perspectives and knowledge practices. In this research setting, artists and physicists share each other's different languages, methodologies, and associative thinking. Recently, we launched our fourth and final phase of the project seen in this diagram here. Our aim, nope, it's not working. Is it? It's, oh yeah, there it is. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Our aim is to transform the grammar of abstract knowledge by specifically addressing the barely discernible phenomena studied by physics through aesthetics, analogy, metaphor, poetry, and other inventive methods. We believe that the process and outcomes of this creative research project has relevance beyond art and physics as it presents an emergent model of practice for the apprehension of complex knowledge and diverse ways of knowing. Since 2017, we've curated 77 artists, uh, as well as masters and undergraduate students, into three phases of project seminars, exhibitions, and symposiums. So through the first process design workshop in 2017, where we brought together artists and physicists, we learned ideas about problem solving through diagramming, visualizing data within the disciplines of physics, and various approaches to creativity. Sharing and unpacking language brings new perspectives and new ways of naming the phenomena of reality. Terminology such as creativity, visualization, and experimentation were placed on the table for lively comparisons. While artists and scientists might share the term visualization, how this is enacted in the studio, a theory room, a lab can vary according to our respective knowledge practices. With each phase of the project, we organize meetings at Triumph with a core team of physicists to formulate a process designed for interactions between the artists and physicists. During the second phase in 2017, 26 artists were partnered with 26 physicists working across a range of media to engage with antimatter, a topic chosen by the physicists. So each production phase also began with a science seminar, which was at Triumph for artists, where the physicists discussed the science topic in relation to their research. They need to explain the topic like antimatter um, or forces in physics without relying on their audience knowing much about scientific knowledge or mathematical equations. The physicists find they are challenged to think that they can describe reality in a way that can actually be radical or unsettling for them while artists can be overwhelmed by the content and challenged to approach thinking in a different way. Here you see the experimental model in 2017, a diagram of phase two process design on the theme of antimatter. This drawing maps out the interactions between artists and physicists along a timeline. Feedback loops during production periods could entail interactions such as Skype calls, lab or studio tours, equipment demos, elevator pictures, pitches, or other forms of imaging. So um, this is an image from that first exhibition, and here you see an installation view of three artists in what we call the dialogical stream, um, who each had to respond to each other's work in a relay uh, of 11 weeks. The first artist in this relay, composer Giorgio Magnanesi, responded to the materiality of the science experiments, such as the physical chirps generated from synthesizing anti-hydrogen atoms produced a soundscape of plasma clouds. Marina Roy, who responded um, to um, Giorgio's work, took this engagement with materiality into paint, riffing on historical ideas about alchemy, but also questioning the degradation of Earth's resources. And then Mimi Gelman, who you will hear from in a moment, uh, responded to these three works with her own kind of engagement with scientific data and Ojibwe patterns and symbols to form new narratives. So in just a moment, Mimi's gonna talk a little more about her engagement with Lowe. The physicists were also invited to respond to artwork, and as you heard from Nirmal in his phase as well, 
Uh, and here in this one, you see Ewan Hill, uh, who designed a physics analysis for interpreting his artist's work. And as if in a physics event, uh, looking for emerging new particles. The mind map here is a post-exhibition analysis of what occurred. There was no translation of antimatter into images and never a kind of comprehensive grasp in the artist's responses, but rather the engagement with antimatter required movement outside of habitual ways of thinking. And so we came to see the mind as a process. And we saw that while the artists were responding to the science, that in fact, the world came into the work. Science philosopher Karen Barad introduces the concept of interaction and the fluidity of materialization through our bodily entanglements with those around us. And she says, not only subjects but also objects are permeated through and through with their entangled kin. The other is not just in one's skin but in one's bones, in one's belly, in one's heart, in one's nucleus, in one's past and future. This is as true for electrons as it is for brittle stars, as it is for the differentially constituted human. So what this suggests is that we need to envision and conduct research with new kinship ties, not only through bodily entanglements, but also across disciplines. So we'd now like to welcome Mimi Gelman to share some thoughts on her low experience. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Ingrid and Randy. I'm particularly interested in the non-binary and in resonances between uh, indigenous knowledges and physics, between art and science, between traditional ways of considering cognition and research methodologies, and with other ways of coming to know through technologies of intuition, astute observation, and kinships with our other than human relations. I'm also interested in how our languages predispose us to holding particular worldviews and therefore might frame or delimit the possibilities of thinking and imagining the existence and structures of other worlds. Before you is a series of images that come from the extraordinary exhibition, Stories and Structures, New Connections, that was mounted in Sydney, Australia, which explored the parallels between representations in indigenous Aboriginal artworks and microscopic structures hidden within the natural world. These juxtapositions reveal unexpected and intriguing similarities, symmetries, and parallels between art and science, and perhaps can help us to further deepen the important connections between art making, aesthetics, storytelling, and especially drawing in the development of complex scientific visualizations. Peoples who are deeply attuned to the land seem to have access to understandings that are, transmi that are transmitted energetically through processes that are as yet to be explained through Western understandings. On the left of the slide is a thrombocyte cell, which helps to protect the crocodile from bleeding excessively when it's being injured. On the right is a painting which tells a story about Bayami, the spirit father, who speared a crocodile, Guria, who'd fallen in love with two women and subsequently swallowed them. The artist, Arcaria Rose Armstrong, stated, Quote, it is said that as Guria was dying, a shower of rain fell and a rainbow appeared. The colors of the rainbow were trapped in the scales of the dying crocodile, which is how the gemstone, the gemstone opal came to be. Which brings me to think about how Western systems of classification and categorization separate us as beings and as things, that we focus on ways that we are different rather than our intrinsic relatedness. As the physicist David Peet remarked, quote, to create a category is to set a boundary in thought. Many indigenous languages are verb-based in contrast with Western languages, noun-based constructions, and these have deep implications for the development of one's worldview. The indigenous scholar Sakaj Youngblood Henderson, a member of the Bear Clan of the Chickasaw Nation and Cheyenne tribe in Oklahoma, 
clarified the nature of indigenous verb-based languages as animate forces with qualities that are contingent and relational. He says, we don't have one God. You need a noun language to have one God. We have forces. All forces are equal, and you are just the amplifier of the forces. The way you conduct your life and the dignity you give to other things gives you access to other forces. Even trees are verbs instead of nouns. The Mi'kmaq, he says, named their trees for the sound that the wind makes when it blows through the trees during the autumn at about an hour after sunset, when the wind usually comes from a certain direction. So one might be like a shu-shu something, or another more like a tinka-tinka something. Although physics is in the Western world has been essentially the quest for the smallest noun, which used to be atom, um, essentially, uh, which, that which cannot be further divided, as they went inside, the atom things weren't acting like nouns anymore. Physicists were intrigued with the possibilities inherent in a language that didn't depend on nouns, but could move right into verbs when the circumstances were appropriate. This next image that you're looking at is the work of Najon Bolmi, an Australian Aborigine born in 1895 in the region of North Australia, now known as Kakadu National Park. Najon Bolmi's rock paintings begin with and include the natural geological formations, chroma, lines, and fissures as a kind of foundational pattern and structure. It is commonly thought in his district that the first layers of the painting were painted by Mimi spirits, no relation to my name who are credited with painting the first rock paintings in Australia and with, giving, and with giving detailed instructions to human beings on how to paint, how to even think about the universe. In this work, the shifting modulated surfaces seem to mimic the nature of the universe, fluid, then solid, diaphanous, and material in flux. The late, David Physis, the late physicist David Peat discusses the indigenous symbol as transcending the sign and as a living embodiment of the teachings. Within indigenous science, he says, a particular symbol is not an abstraction or a reflection of reality that a model within Western science is. Rather, it is something that permits direct connection with the energy, spirits, and animating power of nature. There is, in a sense, like a holograph, a symbol, an object, can unfold the whole of reality. And I think that Pete is referring here to David Bohm's theories on implicate orders. Art has the capacity of transmitting what I call unmediated meaning. Art makes the, the, the invisible visible through processes that are felt through the haptic, through the sum total of our senses. It allows for thinking and experiencing beyond our normal limits, beyond what we think that we know. The final slide shows three of the seven drawings that I did as part of my participation in the first iteration of Leaning Out of Windows. I considered these drawings as thinking with the hand, and I'm positioning drawing as a way of coming to know. What I'm pointing to here is a certain kind of behavior, one that involves and integrates bodies and materials and cognition. As the designer Nigel Cross articulates so well, quote, what most designers and artists do is to draw and redraw lines, shapes, objects, and fuzzy stuff until they can read in or off what has been drawn something useful. We call this operation interactive imagery, the simultaneous or almost simultaneous production of a display and a generation of an image that it triggers. Sketching, then, is not merely an act of representation of a pre-formulated idea. In the context we deal with, it is, more often than not, a search for such an image, and I would say, a search for an idea. And I think it might be productive to think about this as a process of synthesis, which brings me to think that all scientists would benefit from taking drawing classes early in their career education. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. So um, what a pleasure to hear Mimi talk about her work. It really kind of connects to what has already been presented and the way that Lowe is producing these emerging uh, kind of revelations. So um, 
Mimi was part of that first exhibition, which focus was on antimatter. And after that exhibition, we had another series of meetings at Triumph with a team of physicists in spring 2018 to discuss a second process design and determine together um, that the new topic would be emergence. With very experimental models of interactions, we had assessed uh, the process of the previous phase of collaborations and then co-developed a new experimental process design. So here's the diagram of phase three. Uh, in 2019, we generated this new experimental process of interactions for the production of work and an exhibition on emergence. This design entailed 11 teams of 26 artists grouped with scientists. And uh, in this um, next iteration, we included scholars. We actually wanted to open it up um, to sort of add more voices to the conversation. And they worked together over a period of nine months. And, and this, again, was launched with a science seminar for the artists and scholars by the scientists at Triumph. Next one. Um, so this was pre-pandemic, and participants rotated between labs in artist studios, offices, kitchens, and some artists were inspired to dumpster dive at Triumph with the permission of their physicist on hand. Um, we also hear that some of the teams have continued to meet um, after this event, so these conversations are ongoing, which we're delighted to hear. I think we missed one of our slides. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so these are uh, images of the Emergence Exhibition in 2020. And here you're looking at some of the artwork. Uh, this is of three different teams. Um, <laughs> oh, we're missing a slide. Um, well, that one isn't here. Um, uh, but what you're seeing here are some examples of um, uh, project work. Uh, this was actually a, a group that Randy was part of uh, really exploratory, uh, relational. And um, this is uh, work by uh, Teo Monsalve. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go into the next slide as well so that you see um, the works of the different teams in proximity to each other so you can kind of see the interactions and. Uh, in some sense, the conversations that may have emerged in their interactions. Uh, this is a map of responses uh, post-exhibition. And again, it's a way of analyzing what occurred during the process of interactions and represents an iterative response to the ideas and themes generated in the individual artworks as well as the exhibition as a whole. So we're really mapping the overall what happened, what, what comes out of the, the whole weave of, of responses. Um, in designing the final production phase, we met online in spring 2021 with Triumph physicists to discuss the current process design and decided that the topic would be invisible forces. In this new design phase, the interactions would be primarily online. Teams were made up of 26 artists from diverse disciplines and five scholars um, also from diverse disciplines including archaeology, communication design, cultural studies, philosophy, sociology, studies in interdisciplinarity, and there were 10 physicists and they met, uh, Nirmal was one of them, uh, they met over a six month period. Um, team members followed through with iterative-based works that responded to each other and engaged with invisible forces, uh, whether that was granular or metaphorical, utopian, speculative, or even impossible. And um, invisible forces beyond physics, what is that? So in addition to drawing on ideas from physics is the reality that invisible forces offer metaphorical implications such as this very, very provisional list. Um, so this is an image from the um, first exhibition on antimatter. Um, it, it's just very interesting to see how an artist interprets antimatter, um, what is invisible, and sort of how it's manifest in a drawing. So a little bit about the team model of collaboration. Expanding on understanding requires a divergence of thought and a diversity of thinkers, which engages the individual ways of seeing unique to each of us. 
What does it mean to navigate different ways of knowing simultaneously in one's mind, holding different, sometimes contradictory feelings, holding a variety of descriptions for an event, a thing as a process for solving problems? These processes can often be uncomfortable as they contain inherent tensions and confusions, but the challenge is to hold different ways of knowing in relationship. The ways of knowing act on each other, sometimes in unfamiliar, in emergent ways that we cannot predict, but that process is often fertile if we pay attention. So we need to envision and conduct research in anticipation of new kinship ties and new ways of thinking um, and across research areas, we can continue to broaden the potential for emergent forms of communication between disciplines. Thank you. And uh, we are joined uh, by uh, two more participants, uh, by two more uh, physicists, Clara Nellist, uh, who is a particle physicist and science communicator at CERN. Uh, Clara works on analyzing the heaviest known particle and dark matter using machine learning algorithms. Her, works ex uh, her work extends to science communication and photography, and she's part of the inclusion group for equity in research in STEM. Uh, welcome, Clara. Uh, and we have Beatrice Franke with us. Uh, welcome, Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice is an experimental physicist uh, in the field of low energy particle physics. Her main scientific focus is the search for an electric dipole moment uh, in the neutron, an elusive quality which would shed light on the observed lack of antimatter in our universe. As an arts lover, uh, her participation in an earlier uh, stream of low in 2017 is a treasured experience. She's also very passionate about EDI in STEM uh, and thus lives and projects themselves to the students uh, she supervises at Triumph or when she teaches at uh, UBC's physics and astronomy department. Thank you, it is such a pleasure and an honor to have um, all of you and both of you. So um, I think it is, uh, what we have heard is, uh, is, is very fascinating uh, from, from all of our panelists. Um, and uh, as I have been listening, uh, I was thinking about uh, the fact that there are actually two notions of diversity uh, that uh, you have been working with and you have been uh, dealing with. Uh, one of them is the diversity that we, that starts before uh, the project, right? The, way, the diversity that we think in terms of like disciplinary diversity, that we think in terms of like gender, ethnicity, racial diversity. And also, for instance, I'm sure uh, Clara and Beatrice, you're going to talk about like diversities in terms of different publics or in terms of like education. Uh, or in terms of different professions. So these are the diversities that we come to or you come to start working with. But then what is so fascinating, uh, I think, is the emergent diversity uh, that happens once the collaboration starts. Uh, and um, and it is, it's actually a different, uh, I don't know how the diversity that we bring in uh, to, that we start with, uh, and how this emergent diversity that you are all uh, working with and that emerges from the collaboration process within the teams, uh, with working with artists and scientists. Um, how do you see that and how do you, uh, can you speak to that? Because uh, one is, we're, if, when we're dealing with the first, we are definitely dealing with categories and uh, the categories that we all uh, live with, uh, but then there is the practice, uh, then there is the collaboration, and it is, as Nirmal was saying, you're in a very unique position in that sense, Nirmal, because you work with three artists, and, um, and that you said you have no idea which came first, right, where the ideas are coming from. Um, so I was just wondering what you can say about, uh, about these different diversities and, and how uh, they speak to one another. Um, I mean, maybe I can start. And I was thinking as you were saying that, that, um, yeah, we have the diversity of people uh, within the collaboration. But then also for the searches for dark matter, 
um, that we have to do, we have to do so many different diverse experiments and everybody has to bring their different thoughts and ways of searching for dark matter because we don't know what it is. We don't have any idea what it's made of. Um, and so we have all these different experiments and different approaches and so we have diversity of science as well to try and search for this really big puzzle in the universe. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Well, I guess uh, something that comes to mind for me, which is the thing that's kind of haunting my imagination now, is um, the diversity of languages. Like, I think, yeah, the diversity of science, but also the diversity of languages from a disciplinary perspective, but also in terms of the kind of the, the, the history of these, these discourses. And for me, the thing that came forward from our first meeting at Triumph that Ingrid and I had was the word beauty was used. And I was kind of surprised to hear that word used. It was, I think it was used today um, as well. And so my, my, my head kind of tilted a bit because we don't really use that word that much within contemporary art. Um, and if it is used, it always has to be qualified. And, but the physicists use the word beauty all the time. So in terms of this idea of diversity, we have very diverse interpretations of words, of very specific words. And I find that really fascinating. And we can actually just hover on one thing and probably spend you know, six months having a conversation about the history of that term and how it evolves within science and how it evolves within art. So that's the thing that I find most intriguing right now in terms of diversity in relationship to language and this notion that I think, you know, I think you use the word ignorance, Nirmal, but how we come together acknowledging our ignorance and then at that point we begin to understand our default ways of thinking that starts to, I think, um, fragment maybe. Speaking again, uh, about that again, I, it makes me think about Arturo Escobar's work on the pluriverse, and that you know we're thinking about uh, we're, we're evolving ideas around this idea of universe, but in fact we have a world of worlds, and language brings us the possibility of thinking in particular ways, as I said in my very short uh, five-minute uh, talk, and it makes me wonder about what would happen if we actually had more languages that had a grammar of animacy? So that if in this moment, uh, a, a short story, um, someone asked a, um, an Ojibwe elder, is that stone animate? And he thought about it and he said, well, no, but sometimes it is, <laughs> right? So it speaks to the context within which um, uh, a, a, a field, an object arises. And I think that if we were able to share our languages, and I mean the languages that we speak and also the languages of our discourses more, um, uh, more fluidly, I think we'd come to a much more fulsome understanding of this idea of a pluriverse of ideas. I would possibly like to pick up on this duality the example of the stone being uh, animate or not. Animate or not. And uh, something that when you start talking about diversity and, and also relating back to what Nirmal said, um, when we come together in our diversity and start, uh, say in our particular um, example of experimental physicists and we want to come together to build an experiment, there is um, a moment where um, from the diversity we want to channel down to find a solution and a direction that we all can agree on to say build an experiment, nail down requirements and specifications and it, it gets a little narrow at some point because you have to find something to, that everybody can agree on that in some sense it, by that group is considered the optimal solution for the problem. Right, that's where it becomes a little narrow. But then um, uh, moving forward in order to find the, the optimal path, you have to broaden up again and go back to the creative aspect. To this, I remember your slide with having the, the rigorous and, and these on, on the one side and on the other hand, you, had, you have to be very creative actually to be successful in problem solving. And, and I think there then that's the point where after narrowing it down, to, to make a, a solution and find a, find a solution and create a path forward unique to this experiment or say project. And then you open up again and try to be as creative as possible to hone and, and, and improve this one solution that you have all agreed on together and that's where then again you will 
benefit back from the creativity and the diversity of, of the ideas and thought processes that, that all the different members of the, of the group and co collaboration bring in. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, if I can pick up on that, um, it, it's hard enough to come up with, with a simple experiment and to have one single question that you want to answer. But once you've done that, the really interesting situation you can find yourself in is that your experiment offers many further possibilities. So you, you've built your experiment and then you realize in, in talking with different people, with different fields, ideally interdisciplinarily, that what you thought was a one-trick pony is actually a much, much broader uh, device that allows you to go in many different directions. And it's at that moment that the discussions, the most interesting discussions for me happen, because it's at that moment that you can sort of see what, what, you could, what else you could be doing. And this diversity of opinions, diversity of possibilities, of potentialities, um, you can either try to, to limit it to go on in certain directions or you can leave it open as long as possible. And dealing with this diversity and uncertainty is something that's very difficult for collaborations to, de to do. Uh, there's a strong tendency to reduce it again and again and again while keeping all these balls that you're juggling in the air all the time is something that requires an, a leap of faith, an act of faith. And I think that's very important. That's fascinating. Yeah. Maybe I can try to summarize my thoughts by just saying that every time, every time I enter a project, be it collaboration with scientists or artists last year, I'm a different person. And then when I come out of it, I'm a completely different person. So definitely there is a diversity, an emergence of diversity within myself and I'm sure with my collaborators as well. No, this is, this is amazing because uh, what you are saying is that first uh, you, you create a field uh, of commonality, and from that commonality, actually, what emer what emerges and like pieces scatter and I ideas scatter, and then uh, from and in that process, uh, you are becoming different. Not only in terms of um, not only in, um, but also you're becoming different as a physicist, for instance. Exactly, you evolve. No, which which is which I think is um, is amazing, and uh, and let me t t like turn this on to the question of language because we have all been talking about language, and you have all been mentioning language. So uh, does that space uh, that Beatrice you talked about and Michael you also um, contributed to that and um, thought with with Beatrice? Uh, does that also include a commonality of language? Uh, because one of the most interesting things that I think is coming out of the leaning out of windows, uh, the project is these notions of like metaphors and analogies and how we can be bending language or thinking different about language. So how does language play into that, into making diversity? I can start. Um... Maybe I can point out um, the difference and similarity between my experience working with physicists and artists. Um, with artists, as I was mentioning, language was all we had to connect, um, right? Because at least I, I'm from a very different world, so at least I think of myself like that. So, so we were actually using language as an engine to generate ideas um, and, and make concepts out of that. Um, Whereas in physics, we all are linked up, with, we all know the language that we speak. Um, very rarely do, do, does language itself generate ideas. Um, it, it's a specialized language and then it's the ideas that you are pursuing. But in both, we do use a lot of metaphor. It's just different kinds of metaphor. In, in, in the art project, the metaphor itself became the project. Whereas in physics, um, you use metaphor to understand what's going on in nature, but the ultimate aim is to actually get a good picture of what's going on in, in, in the universe. So, so that, yeah, that, that's my take. Maybe to add on the term of language. So something I found very interesting from my personal experience was that, um, so I did my PhD on hardware, so on working on the detector itself. Uh, and after seven years, I moved to start working on analysis in particle physics. Um, and at about the same time, I was living in France, and so I was trying to learn French. And so I was learning a whole new language, trying to integrate into a community. Um, on, in the French, but I was also trying to integrate into a analysis community having come from hardware, and I found it harder 
to move into that new collaboration because I didn't know the language at the time. There were so many acronyms and so many things that I wasn't familiar with, but people assumed that I did because I'd been in the collaborate, I'd been in Atlas for seven years, but I'd been only working on the hardware. Um, and so it was more of a challenge for me to learn the language to then be integrated into the community there than it had been to learn French because with French people assumed I didn't know the words and taught me. Uh, and in the analysis, I had to sort of teach myself in case people found out that I wasn't really an analysis uh, physicist yet. Um, and so that, that kind of inclusion. And so then I take that into my science communication. And I always remember that when I want to talk to people about science and I don't want them to feel excluded by not knowing the language. So often I have to start by making sure that we have a common understanding with the language so that I can explain the science uh, and so people feel included. Uh, yeah. uh, so this is actually a problem that uh, concerns collaboration or the size of collaboration. In a collaboration of 3,000 people, uh, the diversity of approaches and diversity of attitudes and diversity of languages is actually contraproductive in some way if you want to achieve a common result. So you have to narrow it down. Too many clans will not work together, so you have to reduce that. In a small collaboration like mine, it's the contrary. We're, we're about 30 people with a dozen different languages, and there this diversity is actually conducive to coming up with new ideas uh, because of the misunderstandings that you can then allow. Misunderstandings in terms of what you're talking about, how you're talking about, um, how to think about certain problems, and then coming to a uh, an understanding of each other's ambiguities and what the meaning behind it is often lets new ideas emerge that were not there in the beginning. So building on that and thinking about language, the one thing that ties, I think, everyone in this room together is visual language. And so how diagrams help us, how videos help us, mm -hmm. and the ways that um, through, for example, we can understand certain kinds of constructs through the paintings of Hilma of Klimt. If you, if you, you should look, take a look at her paintings if you haven't seen her paintings. Um, or many other artists, um, I'm thinking of uh, Robert Irwin and his work with optics. And that, that visually and sensorily and through the haptic, through the sum total of our senses, we can um, sort of cross the divide that uh, the spoken language limits us with. I would love to pick up on that. Um, there, so there is this cliche, right, that scientists or physicists, maybe mathematicians, have their one common language, math, or engineers can like talk in drawings to each other. Um, and that's true to a certain extent, and it's, it's I guess it applies both to big collaborations like Atlas two, 3,000 people and CMS, or small ones like yours or the one I work in, where like 45, 50 people. Um, but then there's also sometimes the, the opposite happening because it's most of the time a very international collaboration. And you do not only have the clashes of languages, but also cultures. And that can actually sometimes um, be a, a mix of upsides and downsides because you, um, it f like the diversity fosters creativity and ideas and collaboration. But it can also sometimes be a, a little bit of a hindrance because you have to find a common ground also culturally that, that works for everybody. And, and there can be, in, in the communication, um, it, it can happen that maybe certain things are not as expressed as clearly because in, in, if you work with people from a different culture, from a different ethnic background, that, that communication might be inhibited because of cultural, say, habits or, and, and we've experienced this it's a few times and I guess what I would think helps there is <clears throat> um, getting to know each other better, right? You, you have to, you work together for a, a longer time. And I think what you said earlier is, is really beautiful and I think that it's a good reminder what um, as physicists and maybe all of us would, would be a good, good thing to do is to remind ourselves that we need to make sure when we start talking to each other we're all on the same page. And we have a common starting ground where we can um, connect and make sure 
we give everybody the same opportunity to, to be included and our ideas to be discussed without not feeling included or, or, or not being able to be a proper part of the communication. Um, one of the challenges um, in education and culturally in the world is the silos that we have within uh, knowledge practices. And that is something that I think a lot of us are working to undo as we're in a very uh, complex uh, 21st century time uh, with so many issues to uh, look at and solve and not one uh, discipline or one knowledge practice will ever be able to uh, take that on. And uh, one of the things about um, bringing together different kinds of uh, practitioners of of, of knowledge practices is that they're going to be using different kinds of languages or even the same word might mean something else. But that moment of, I think, a connection, a node of overlap uh, makes everyone see things in a different way. And your brain, I think, changes um, in that moment of seeing in a, in a different way. And, and that's not just you know, seeing in two different ways, but suddenly you have these complex nodes of seeing. It keeps opening up new portals of understanding uh, the phenomenon of reality, not just in the physics sense, but also in the, uh, the political sense. And, um, and one of the strange things that uh, 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 Richard Feynman said was that uh, uh, people are just like particles, atoms of plus and minus parts, and they interact that way, which is a really strange, you know, kind of cold way of describing uh, human behavior, but, but it's something interesting to take up and to think about. Um, uh, so that's like, you know, one view of, 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 of many views. So, um, so that kind of diverse way, or, or like um, the aspect of, you know, the living mountain, where a geo, geologist, geologist said to me, well, this mountain, this Rocky Mountain, grows at the same rate that your fingernail grows every year. So suddenly this epic force is like something in me as well. Uh, so again, it's that, that sense of connecting oneself suddenly to um, a bigger world. Um, and the artists that I work with, one of the things that, that we talk about is how um, uh, how odd we are by, you know, when we think about those bigger things and not like these little kind of natty arguments that happen between uh, people, but that kind of bigger sense of where we are, that big picture, that reminding us about where we are. And that is um, uh, one of the benefits of being able to have these exchanges across uh, disciplines. Yeah, I just wanted to add here, I just keep, I'm, I'm thinking about this in my head when, uh, I think it was after our first uh, exhibition and we met up with the physicists again. This is in light of language and diversity. Um, so leaning out of windows is, is a metaphor for leaning out of your, your area, your discipline, in order to feel a little uncomfortable, a little precarious, and then something opens up, as I think what's been said. So we had our meeting with the physicists post-exhibition and, um, this is in light of the idea of physicists are often like um, stereotypically, they, they're, they're narrowing down the focus, they have this purpose. And so we were talking about what we were doing and it was sort of all over the place. We were just trying to figure out how to move forward. And one of our physicists said, this isn't a fishing trip, right? And so as if to suggest like, let's be clear here that we are looking for something. And Ingrid and I looked at each other and we both thought, it is. It is a fishing trip. So from, from his perspective as a physicist, he wanted clarity, he wanted purpose, he wanted direction. And from our perspective, this idea of the fishing trip as a metaphor opened up for us that we weren't, we didn't have clear outcomes. But so the fishing trip gave us the language which n was not what the physicist wanted, but it actually fed us in a way that he hadn't anticipated. And I just thought that was such an amazing moment in our process and the way that language opens up way things in ways that you can never anticipate. And it still makes me giggle. It makes me think also, and I was thinking um, after M Michael spoke, about what happens in those moments, so you, you're kind of narrowing things down and then things open up, it's improv, right? It's improvisation. And that's something also that runs across all of our disciplines. Uh, Michael, you also said leap of faith, right? So I'm thinking about the, that moment when I was sitting with my physicist 
in one of our first three hour um, you know, exchanges and I was saying, now, you know, talk to me, I'm, a ki I'm, I'm, from, I'm in kindergarten and uh, now tell me what you do. So, you know, break it down that simply. And, and so we were talking around what I do and was, we were sort of perplexed at one another. And I said, you know what really interests me is scientists who are believers. And he said, I'm a believer. I said, you are? He says, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I said, okay, now let's talk. And so what that opened up was a discussion around energetic forces. It, it, we started looking at the way that we riff on in, within our own disciplines and how important this idea of imminent readiness is. You set everything up, right? You're looking at an experiment and you're, you're readying yourself for that epiphany, for that moment, that just happens, right? Where that, that idea that's not really yours, but that comes together through improvisational tactics, through that, that you know, readying yourself for that happening. Thank you, and um, this conversation is actually um, making me think of um, something uh, that Jacques Lacan said, which is what is said and what is heard are completely always different, uh, and what makes the innovation or creativity possible is what happens in between in that space, in that gap uh, of what is said and what is heard, um, which is fantastic. And I think that in terms of improvisation and in terms of how we deal with, or how you and partially me also as part of the group that deals with, um, with these difficulties is, is some kind of an openness uh, and precisely a leap of faith into what collaboration can bring and in, a leap of faith with re regards to uh, we are doing this and what is going to become is just emergence. So we are partially in that sense, both leaving our diversities at the door, but also partially like allowing some of them speak through us without even knowing and thinking about it. So um, I want to come back to something that uh, Beatrice, uh, you pointed out, um, which I also had some this in mind because diversity is not only always uh, leading to um, a positive outcome, but it can be sometimes have present difficulties. Uh, and you said uh, sometimes communication is inhabit uh, is inhibited by by cultural habits, uh, and I'm still wanting to think about it in terms of like. Uh, this, this distinction between what is said and what is heard, uh, but also is it um, like when does it become a problem? When does it become a hindrance in terms of like when does it become a limit? Uh, this uh, communication or differences in language. Uh, can you speak to that in terms of collaboration? I mean, maybe I can start on. Uh there have been studies on teams um, that show that diverse teams uh, take longer to start working on a problem. So if you have a very homogenous team, then they can just very quickly, they have the communication, they can start working on the problem. And diverse teams take longer to get started on a problem, but then afterwards it's shown that they're more likely to come up with a better solution, um, to come up with innovative solutions. So it can be a hindrance at the beginning and maybe that frustrates people and people remember that at the beginning, but the outcome and the solution is almost always better when you have a diverse team. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add in terms of the hindrance in the first iteration we paired artists up with physicists. So every artist had their physicist. They would say, my physicist. And then the physicist would say, my artist. So it was really interesting to see that. But in terms of the hindrance, we saw that sometimes 
they, you know, we, we sort of set it up and we assume people are going to, uh, you know, let this conversation unfold. But we've seen examples where the physicist is waiting for the artist to reach them, to ask questions, and the artist doesn't. The artist sort of, in some ways, artists sometimes are like herding cats, and they just do their own thing. And I think we sort of saw this. So as a result of the, we, we actually ended up producing, in the next iteration, not just pairs, but teams. And we felt like teams, there was more of a responsibility. So it was interesting for us to learn, and we had to learn that, um, that pairs don't work, and it was a hindrance in some way. So I just wanted to add that. So, sorry. Um, so in, in physics, uh, I wanted to add uh, to what Clara was saying. Um, not only do diverse teams end up solving the problem, often it happens that they end up actually finding more problems um, along the way. And, and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. That's, that's I guess that's called blue skies research. And, um, and that, that, that way everybody learns more and then there's more things to think about and then the, the, the bigger tapestry of nature comes together. It, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I have to add, every time I start out with a diverse team, I'm always frustrated to begin with. <laughs> but then I end up, when the project ends, I'm really happy. I've, I've learned a lot, I've evolved a lot. So. Um, I just, uh, I think sometimes uh, that the, the diversity of views creates a kind of a dance as well, and then there's a, a need to uh, for the various parties to give of themselves in a, in a way. Um, and, and I'm just thinking about um, the physicists that we worked with, that Sanam, you were in the team with me, and. Um, just putting out things sometimes where you feel like you're challenging the scientist, where, uh, for example, I, I was quoting from a poet, Muriel Rukeyser, who said, uh, the world is not made of atoms, the world is made of stories. And uh, our physicist, David Morris, he, he sprang right in there and he said, yes, theories are stories. You know, and so he, he entered the dance uh, and, and opened up that idea of, of the construction of theories uh, as stories themselves. So it gave us a whole other view of, of what a theory could be while he probably also, you know, in that sense, entered into a, a kind of an openness of like the improvisation of, yeah, let's play with that idea. So maybe one thing, another thing that just came to mind listening to these things is that, and also relating, you said like, in diverse teams, sometimes it can be frustrated in the beginning, and I think there can be a certain discomfort, right, to when you're in a very diverse setting. And, and, but I think this is something that is very important to get through, and I mean, scientists are often like renowned for their resilience. We have to be, because there's a lot of failure in experimental approaches, theoretical too. Um, but I think the learning to get through this discomfort and not being disencouraged by being uncomfortable is also a very big parallel to the, the big picture discussion of, of diversity and equity and inclusion in general. Because there are a lot of questions that I think we're, we're nowadays, fortunately, finally discussing as a society, um, but that do imply like we, we, we have to feel uncomfortable at certain points when we're discussing uh, ethnic or gender related questions, right? If, if it's, it's important that we get made feel uncomfortable at some point because that's a very big, uh, um, requirement for us to be able to grow. So, I, I would maybe I maybe want to take back my words that it's it's not really a hindrance, but maybe an initial like stone that has to be or a stepping stone. Right? It might seem an obstacle at the beginning, but once we get over it, we can all elevate each other and and grow. So so yeah, that that going getting through that discomfort. Whatever it might it might manifest in, but I think that's a a, a good way of depicting it. Yeah, when when I said it, uh, hindrance, I oh, I had in mind mostly the limit, right? I mean, we have to see a limit, and without seeing a limit, we cannot we won't be able to cross it. Uh, and in that sense, I think you put it beautifully in terms of like, yes, we have to be uncomfortable to be de discussing these very difficult issues uh, in classrooms, in collaborations, uh, in different spaces that we are, so absolutely. 
Uh, I'd like to use uh, Clara's uh, notion in the future when talking to the funding agencies and explaining why things take so long. Because this is it's sort of an external problem and I'm not sure it's the right place to talk about it. But if things take long and results take longer to be achieved, you are not supported the way you are if you are a homogenous team that can just run, hit the ground running and then get results. Uh, so this is, it's an external limitation of the diversity. It doesn't come from the diversity itself. It's the way the overall system is set up, that diversity is not encouraged by uh, funding agencies or the way uh, science is evaluated. I think it also speaks to how we're beginning to look at time. And um, I don't know um, if it's happening in other institutions, but certainly here at Emily Carr, we've, we're coming to recognize that um, we're speeding up for some reason, not the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And that slowing down, maybe having less content, uh, reflecting more deeply, you know, um, and, um, and also that when we begin to engage with, um, uh, with complexity, it's messy, right? And we have to be, we have to be um, uh, ready and willing to uh, get in the fro, you know, to, to get in the mess uh, until we, we, you know, we have enough time to get to the jewel, right? The, just a, a quick comment to the diversity in collaborations. This is something that uh, perhaps is not the case in the very large collaborations where you have an evening out of differences, uh, but in collaborations of our size, I think there's a very critical problem that we have encountered, uh, and that has to do with the stability of collaborations. I've seen small groups um, of specific nationalities work very poorly with specific groups of other nationalities because of their cultural our priorities, the way they expect communication to happen. Um, if I think of putting, for example, a volleyball Italian together with a rather uh, quiet Finn, um, that communication is very difficult and it can generate friction to the point that these collaborations will break apart. Uh, there's, there's sort of a valley of instability and then you get into the very large collaborations of 200, 300, 2,000 people where the, the, the moderating effect of the diversity then kicks in again. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you so much. I'm, unfortunately, we, are, uh, we have the external limitation of time, uh, and we are <laughs> at, at the hour. Um, before closing, I would like to invite Nina to say a couple of things. And, um, and personally, I would like to thank all the panelists and, uh, and presenters. Um, we have, we, I think there are so many issues on table that we can continue talking at least for uh, another hour, two hours, but maybe we can discuss them um, at the reception, um, which is going to be outside. Uh, so, um, thank you. Thank you. So, this is Ilan, good. So, um, what a wonderful and, and thoughtful uh, conversation. I hope you can all take something home from, th from that, and I'm sure we can further discuss it during the networking reception afterwards. So thank you, Sanem, for this thoughtful moderation. Um, you, really, you, you, really, you really did a great job. I really enjoyed the conversation. And then uh, thank you, Beatrice and Nirma, for representing Triumph. Thank you, Mimi, Ingrid, and Randy, for representing today's host institution, Emily Carr University. And thank you, Michael and Clara, for traveling all the way from Europe to Vancouver representing our Swiss partner institution, CERN, and for being here today. So thank you very much. And before we heading out, I would like to briefly mention a few other events that we are hosting in the framework of the Swiss Innovation Fest. So tomorrow morning, we have a hybrid fireside chat between the CERN director, Fabiola Gianotti, and Triumph director, Nigel Smith. It's moderated by my colleague, Urs Obris, from the Swiss Embassy. So it's hybrid because Urs and Nigel are going to meet at the New Media Gallery and Fabiola is going to zoom in, literally zoom in. So, 
and um, you're all welcome to join virtually. Um, you find all the information either on the website of the Innovation Fest, we have an Instagram channel and the LinkedIn page, so we'll find all the information there. And then um, on Tuesday, we have a film screening at the Cinematec in, in downtown Vancouver um, on the film CERN and the Sense of Beauty. It's an exceptional art movie about the, the, the artistic work at CERN. And then on June 4th, we will open the exhibition Indivisible at New Media Gallery in New Westminster. It's featuring two uh, former artists in residence from Arts at CERN, which Michael, thank you for introducing them. I think that was a good kickoff for, for this exhibition. And one of the artists that are gonna be there is Semiconductor, which you also showed a piece of, piece of art. So there's a lot coming. Um, it would be nice to welcome you at one of our other events. And now I don't want to stand in the way of the networking reception and wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.